My name is Kevin Monikaraj. I'm from South Face. I'm a project manager here. And I'm Abby Francisco. I'm also with South Face and a project engineer here. Um, and thank you all for joining us here today for to learn a little bit more about the Small Commercial Energy and Water Efficiency Assessment Toolkit created by South Face. We're excited to have you guys test out this toolkit in the field and get your feedback on it. To give you a little bit of background on who South Face actually is, we are a nonprofit located in Atlanta, Georgia, and we work to make homes, communities, and workplaces more sustainable through our four pillars, which are education, research, advocacy, and technical assistance. So we made this toolkit under one of our research grants, and this grant is called the Advanced Commercial Buildings Initiative. It's a three-year, $4 million grant awarded by the DOE, and we are in the last year of the grant right now. The focus of it is energy and water efficiency in small commercial buildings, and so that includes existing and new buildings. So for existing buildings, we're aiming at getting a 20% improvement in efficiency, and for new buildings, it's meeting the 50% energy efficiency improvement with the Architecture 2030 Challenge. And that's equivalent to essentially a 25% improvement over ASHRAE 90.1 2007. So diving into the structure of the grant, there, are, there was a research phase, a demonstration phase, and then a deployment phase. With the research phase, we did things such as circuit level monitoring of buildings, um, diagnostic testing, blow door testing uh, at sample buildings. As, and then we moved on to the demonstration and deployment phase, which is where we are now and how this toolkit was made with the, the goal of deploying it into the market. We also are going to be developing several, several other toolkits as uh, a result of this grant, including something called the Campus Guide, which focuses on how to make campuses more energy and water efficient. And there's actually going to be a webinar upcoming on that on June 15th. So be looking out for an email to register for that if you are interested. And now I'll pass it on to Kevin to talk more specifically about how this toolkit can help you. Great. So that's the question. How can the toolkit help you? Well, first of all, we want to support you in making your level one and level two ASHRAE audits. So that's the main reason why we have this toolkit. Secondly, we want to give you the ability to prioritize your efficiency measures. And then finally, we want you to be able to pinpoint sources of your energy and water spikes. We've all had them. We've all seen them in our buildings. Hopefully this toolkit will help you figure out where they are and maybe make some recommendations moving forward. So let's back up a little bit and say, why do we even care about small commercial buildings? Well, if you look over on these uh, two charts here, we can see that the percent of total commercial buildings, 94% of those are less than 50,000 square feet. If you look at the total commercial floor space of these buildings, it's still just about half of it. So we're, we're talking about the majority of your small commercial buildings taking about half of the total commercial floor space. That's a lot of area and it's a lot of energy being used. Speaking about the energy, if we look at the major fuel consumption, it mirrors that of the floor space for your small commercial buildings. So again, we have a very large market for energy here, and all of it needs to be addressed. So let's start off with a very simple trivia question. Um, in a minute here, you'll get a poll about which one of these buildings uses the most energy. Is it education buildings, your schools? Is it food service buildings like your restaurants, lodging, warehouse or storage, or even your religious or worship buildings? I'll give everyone a minute. Education. Okay, all right. So looks like we have some uh, answers here, and we have almost a tie between food service and lodging. Oh, and education as well. So between those three, well, let's see what we have. Food service actually has the most energy used per square foot. It varies quite a bit, as you could imagine. But if you, take a, if you think about it practically, we're talking about a lot of electricity being used. We're talking about a lot of gas being used. 
we have your heating and cooling for your customers. So this makes a whole lot of sense. Let's think about now which one uses the least amount of energy. And I'll give everyone a minute for this one as well. So what we have left is your education, your lodging, uh, your warehouse, and your religious. All right, looks like most of you have said your religious or worship buildings. It, in fact, is actually your warehouse and storage. And again, this, now that you know, makes a little more sense. Uh, with your warehouse and storage, really it's just the roof over your products or, or your area, and it doesn't require too much energy to be maintained. So now we have our spread. We have our spread between our food service taking up the most, your warehouse being the least, and pretty much every other major commercial building falling in between to varying degrees. So with all of this comes our huge disclaimer, right? That your mileage may vary. We get it. It completely depends on your building. So you might have a warehouse that actually uses a lot more than your neighbor's restaurant. But with all of this, you have to identify exactly where you're using the most energy. So hopefully our toolkit can be used for this purpose. So let's look at some recommendations by number. Uh, let's look at these recommendations by number of uh, efficiency measures we have actually recommended throughout our Grants to Green program. As you might imagine, retrofit lighting takes the majority of it, followed by our low slope plumbing, our building envelope, um, then our appliance and plug loads, and then finally our building automation system. So those are actually the items we're going to talk about the most. So I'll start with actually the uh, lighting retrofit, taking up our 30% of our recommendations here. We'll start with a quiz. So given the cost of LEDs, it makes more financial sense to retrofit T12 fixtures with T8. So let's see what you guys think about if that's a true or false statement. All right, we're getting a few answers here. All right, so it looks like we think that that might be false. And that's exactly correct. With the cost of LEDs today and how quickly they're dropping, it actually does make a lot of sense to retrofit your T12s and your T8s to your LEDs. It's also important to note that if you are retrofitting your T12s to T8s, you will get a payback. But with the functionality and the practicality of LEDs, you gain more control over your lighting. You get uh, better space density for your lighting. So overall, your LEDs actually have a better payback. This sort of propels us into our next quiz here in terms of retrofitting on a one-to-one -one scale. When you take down your existing lights and you're putting new ones up, if you're taking LEDs as your retrofits, do you have to make them one-for-one? -one? All right, looks like Everyone agrees on false, and that's exactly correct. Uh, as you might know, you have higher lumens for your LEDs for an equivalent version of your fluorescence, which means you can actually maybe skip every other light, skip every third light. With good building design, you can actually skip a whole lot and save both on money and electricity. So let's move on to our low flow plumbing fixtures. All right, another trivia question. Which of these cities has the highest combined water, sewer, and stormwater costs? Is it Seattle, is it Atlanta, Charlotte, or Salt Lake City? Looking like we have people from all over the country here. All right, so the majority of you say Atlanta, and that's exactly correct. So for those of you that chose Seattle, you're not too off. In fact, if you look at this chart, you can look at what you can expect for the price of water in each of these cities. Atlanta and Seattle really taking the, the biggest chunks here. Uh, as you can imagine, you, we have California represented pretty well, areas in Texas represented pretty well, but Atlanta does have an extremely high cost for your water here. So if anyone has an idea of what that means for retrofitting your water, Abby, what do you think? I think it's probably going to make your payback a lot quicker if the cost of water goes up. Exactly. So it's always a good idea to retrofit your water fixtures. All right, guys. Um, we're going to move on talking about building envelope modifications. And starting off with another trivia question. 
which of the following of these statements are false? And you can select all that apply. A, lead buildings are efficient and airtight. B, building age is an indicator of how leaky it is. And C, building materials chosen can help predict building tightness. give you guys a little bit more time for this question. All right, so we have about 75% of people thinking that the first two statements are false, and then 50% of people thinking that the last statement is false. And what's the answer? They're all false. Um, and while this might not seem as intuitive um, as you might think, what we found through our research is that the most important indicator of how tight your building is is simply if you're paying attention to if your thermal and air barrier are consistent throughout your building envelope. Um, and that that was the primary indicator of uh, how tight your building was. So just to go over what your building envelope is, so everybody's on the same page, it's what's dividing your conditioned interior air between the exterior outside air. And so that consists of all your exterior walls, your roof, your floor, your windows. And based on how tight those are, um, your building's going to either lose or keep in um, the, the air that it's heating and cooling inside the building. So through our research, we did lower door testings of over 40 buildings uh, in the Atlanta region. And to get just some background on blower door tests, you're essentially putting a fan on an exterior door and pushing air either into or out of the building, and then measuring how much air is leaving through the building envelope. So leaving through your penetrations due to ducts or due to wires or um, having top plates not sealed or other exterior walls intersections not completely sealed, and it's measuring how much air is passing through there. So on this graph, you'll see that it's graphing something called the ELR. And the ELR is the total air leakage of the building divided by the square footage of the building envelope. So it's normalizing for the size of your building. And on this graph, the lower the number, the better. It means your building, the, the more tight it is. And you can see here we're graphing two sets of buildings, ECLC buildings and non-ECLC. ECLC is a um, Earthcraft light commercial. It's a green certification program offered by South Face. And a requirement of the program is that you have an ELR of 0.5 or less. So for these buildings, early on in the design phase, it was identified as a priority to pay attention to all the gaps and cracks um, in your building envelope and make sure that those are sealed during the construction process. And because of that um, forethought and those ideas happening in the beginning, uh, those bu buildings ended up much tighter than buildings just from the general building stock where that wasn't, uh, air sealing wasn't as prioritized. And so does envelope air leakage matter? Well, we know it makes a difference on your energy consumption, but it can also have an impact on your building durability and even aesthetics. We can see in this picture, um, you know, something very common in commercial drop ceiling tiles, moisture buildup on the tiles. And this is happening because your building envelope, particularly the attic in this situation, is has holes in it that is um, splitting in, in hot, humid air. And these holes can happen at the intersection of different building joints, as well as you can see a can light that's outside that may not be sealed, um, as well as other penetrations that allow the hot, humid air to condense on the ducts in the building and then drop water down onto the drop ceiling tiles. We also, as part of our blower door test, uh, use fog to see where the air leakage is actually happening in the building. And you can see in this particular building, it was a dining hall seeking ECLC certification. So they're trying to get an ELR of less than 0.5. And in their original construction, they uh, decided to have a spray foam roof line. But then that was value engineered out to have a simple flat decking. And that flat decking was actually two feet above the drop, the drop ceiling. Um, so in that left 
video above, the fog is actually going into condition space. And two feet above that is the decking with the insulation on it. And there were duct penetrations through this decking. There were wire penetrations that were just really difficult to feel. And you can see air leakage clearly happening with this fog. It's um, going in into condition space right there and then coming out of the dormers in the building. And they ended up having to go back and spray foam the roof line in order to meet the um, air leakage requirement, which obviously costs more money than just doing that um, to begin with. And other common sources of um, leakage we saw was with rooftop units on buildings. You can see here on the left, we're spraying foam up towards the ceiling um, from inside the building and the, um, not foam, fog. And the fog coming out of the rooftop unit at the top, um, this rooftop unit wasn't sealed to um, the roof, nor was it even mechanically fastened. So that's something we definitely recommend. Um, in addition to mechanically fastening your rooftop units is masticking around the penetrations and to the end side. It's a common source of leakage. And finally, this particular building, uh, one of our coworkers actually popped his head above the drop ceiling tile and noticed a shim fall on his head. And he looks up and he's like, where are these shims coming from? And they were actually put in at the intersection of two waffle metal roof decking pieces. And, and we're, we noticed that this was a common source of lots of air leakage just because it's really, unless you're paying attention to it, it's, it the, these penetrations of the waffle decking have tons of air leakage on them. So that's just something to pay attention to is to make sure that you're with that material is that you're paying more attention to sealing um, their penetrations to reduce as much air leakage as possible. Moving on to appliances and plug loads. Um, one of the really exciting things we were able to do through the research was circuit level monitoring of um, 12 commercial buildings. And before I dive into the results of that, I'll set off this trivia question about vending machines. Vending machines can cost over $1,000 per year, excluding the merchandise to rent the machine. All right, most of you guys, actually all you guys have answered this correctly. It is a, true, vending machines can cost over $1,000 per year. And we saw this through our circuit level monitoring. One of our sites was spending $20,000 per year for um, utility costs. And one of their circuits, we didn't know what it led to, was eating up 5% of their energy use, which was fairly substantial for an outlet. And it, we followed you know, where the circuit went to, and it ended up being just one vending machine that was causing 5% of their energy use, and all they had to do was simply unplug it to get that much savings per year. Um, and so vending machines can vary. Their energies can vary drastically. This was a particularly old and inefficient one. But what we, what we like to say at South Face is the most efficient is off. And if you need to have a vending machine there, uh, we recommend installing vendomizers, which can minimize your compressor runtime with, to only when it's uh, needed during occupied hours, as well as just removing the lights in all your vending machines. It's not really necessary. But really, you'd be better off financially to just, um, you could go and buy uh, a certain carbonated beverage, maybe with a red and white logo for your employees, and, uh, and for free. And, and that would end up, that it'd be given for free to them, and you'd spend much less money in the end. And lastly, we're going to go over building automation system modifications. And we're going to end with this trivia question for this section. For typical HVAC systems, setbacks offer negligible savings. Okay, so we have the majority of answers as being false. And just to go over, and that's correct. And to go over what a setback is, setbacks 
happen. Um, you're lessening the aggressiveness of your thermostat when the building is unoccupied. So for a typical building that's not occupied at night in the winter, you might adjust your setback from around or adjust your set point from around 70 degrees to getting down to 60 degrees to save energy at night. And a lot of times when we go into buildings, we have people asking us, is it really worth it to do this? Our, our uh, mechanical systems are ramping up in the morning, and is, it, is that using up more energy in the end? And for typical HVAC systems, it is worth it to put setbacks on your thermostat. Of course, there are always some exceptions to this rule um, or things to take note of. First of all, if your building has heat pumps with auxiliary strip heat, it's really important that you have a thermostat with a lockout temperature or adaptive recovery technology that can ensure that your auxiliary strip heat is only operating when necessary due to just extreme cold temperatures. Otherwise, it should only be the heat pump heating your building, as well as um, another exception may be if you have a high efficiency VRF system that's inverter driven um, where the savings due to setbacks uh, can be closer to negligible. I would now like to talk about the toolkit itself. The file set is located under the supporting documents sidebar of the small commercial energy and water assessment toolkit webpage. To get to this webpage, go to the advanced commercial building initiative section of the southface.org website by pulling down the programs tab. Once on this page, the link to the toolkit is located on the measuring section page, or you can search for the toolkit itself and the results will, will reveal a clickable link. The content on the Small Commercial Energy and Water Assessment Toolkit webpage outlines all of the following pieces to the toolkit, including procedures for energy and water assessments, a Word document that provides detailed guidance for each step of the assessment process, the Energy and Water Assessment Workbook, an Excel sheet that we'll demonstrate in a few moments, the Energy and Water Assessment Report Template, a Word template that provides content, structure, and formatting guidance for a client assessment report, a presentation template example, a sample slide deck for presenting assessment findings to the client, and lastly, the Energy and Water Efficiency Project Implementation Verification Checklist. These are the main toolkit documents, but in addition, we have included an a portfolio manager guide in case you are unfamiliar with Energy Star Portfolio Manager. We also have a Georgia Power commercial rate calculator if you are a Georgia Power commercial consumer and our own HVAC calculator which you can use in conjunction with the toolkit. So let's jump into the toolkit itself. Abby will pull it up and run you through how to use Energy Star Portfolio Manager. All right, when you open up the toolkit, you'll see it starts with an instructions page. I would highly recommend going through this page uh, before using the toolkit. Uh, we won't be going over it today, though. We'll jump right into inputting dat utility data from Energy Star Portfolio Manager, which is the first step from using this. And like Kevin said, if you don't, aren't familiar with Portfolio Manager, we have a guide for how to use it in the toolkit. Uh, but here, and here's the actual um, interface with uh, ESPM, we're on South Face's building. Um, you can see uh, energy usage, water usage graph, it's pretty handy. But what we're going to be using today is the actual output from Portfolio Manager. And so just on the main page, you're going to click Download Property to Excel. And what that's going to pull up is a spreadsheet such as this. And today we're going to be looking at the Cabin and Abbey Emporium of Efficiency, and um, we're going to see what type of opportunities we have specific to our building. And so first thing you're going to do is, and this is again included in the instructions, um, but we're going to copy all these tabs, click Move or Copy, into the actual South Face Small Commercial Energy Assessment Workbook. And I'm just going to move those to the end of the workbook. Okay, so now they're all inserted into the workbook. We're going to move up to the utilities page. Um, I'm on the electric bills tab. And the first thing to do is just refresh the data to make sure you have the uh, most up-to-date tabs inserted in. And you can see this is all, this is straight from the ESPM download. It will take your electric, electric bills, gas bills, and water bills 
and graph them into the individual tabs. Um, you can change the time range that the, that the um, graph is showing. And it's important to note that these numbers, if you notice these numbers don't match up with your utilities bills, it's because it's actually um, per ASHRAE guidelines dispersed across the 30 days for each month. So if you have a bill from January 15th to February 15th, it's splitting up um, the bill so that it fits for the actual days in each month. Um, and if you go to the main utilities tab, this is a summary of um, the utility info just entered in from Portfolio Manager. And it's important to note that this workbook at the top, it lists the precedent sheets and dependent sheets. So if you would like to dive into the, what's happening in the background of the workbook, you can refer to the tabs that are being referenced uh, for a particular sheet. And First on this page is the actual cost structure, which you can enter in yourself by just getting um, your, the rates, how you like to calculate them, or with our toolkit, if you use Georgia Power, we do have a Georgia Power rate calculator. You can see here in the electricity that it, you can enter in the average rate or the marginal rate, and it says enter in the average rate or the marginal rate and marginal demand. Um, I'm not going to dive into detail about that now, but basically you have the option to enter either of these. So let's say you wanted to enter in the average rate of $10 per kilowatt hour. You can see that the marginal rates are now blacked out, so you can't, you shouldn't input numbers into those cells. Um, and it's the average rate that will be used for the lighting calc calculator that we will show later on. Um, also on this page, you can enter in uh, the dates that you want to be on your graphs for the utility consumption, as well as summary tables for your total electricity use, natural gas use, energy, uh, water use, and the associated cost. And then finally with this page, and I'll only touch on this now, is you'll see graphs, and these are graphs that are in the report template too, um, but it's essentially graphing your energy use intensity and water use intensity which can be read more about um, on Energy Star's website. But let's say you wanted to, um, we wanted to compare Cav, the Cavan Abbey Emporium of Efficiency, um, which right now is at a 64 kBTUs per square foot. And we looked up the average for this building type was 50. So you can see the national median here is 50. We're slightly above 50. Um, let's say we want to get to a goal of 45. We want to go a little bit below. Um, so those, we have, you know, these graphs here, which are ones that we commonly use for our analysis, which we thought might be helpful to you all also. And it's important to note that throughout this workbook, this is the second generation from it. Um, there are definitely going to be um, things to add um, to it to make it better. So we welcome any and all feedback um, about the toolkit and um, thoughts that you have when you're using it. And next, I'm going to pass it over to Kevin to go over the um, lighting and plumbing calculators, as well as the overview tab. Great. So we have here an overview of what you will be seeing in a building. So for those of you who have gone on a energy audit, you will know that you will be taking notes throughout the audit itself. You'll be talking about talking to the building manager about the number of occupants, the number of bathrooms, so on and so forth. So we're trying to give you an easy way of capturing all that. So the tabs that are listed in green here, so we have the overview, the lighting, the plumbing, and the equipment, as well as the building, these can actually all be printed out. And when you print them out, if you just say control print, you'll actually realize that we have formatted it in such a way such that they all fit on single sheets. You don't need to worry about double printing or extending any borders. It'll all fit there, and whatever you have on the sheet is what you're going to want to take with you. So some items to note would be, for example, the number of full-time employees that you have. We've listed that there are 30 males and 30 females. We're just, uh, providing a distinction between the two just for bathroom and water use purposes. We've also noted that there's some visitors that are in this building. And if we so choose, we could say maybe we're selling things so we have retail customers or some students. So this is uh, where you're going to want to capture this information. Let's now move over to the lighting survey. 
let's say you are now walking through the building and you'd like to capture what type of lighting you have in the different rooms. In this particular instance, we're saying that in our kitchen, we have found some recessed T8 lighting fixtures, and we found about 17 of them that are all on one manual control. We're noting that here, and we can keep uh, adding on to our different items, uh, talking about the kitchen, the bathroom, the hallway. You can add your own room here. Let's say there is uh, um, a, another bathroom upstairs that's a, a single use. You, you could use that and add that over there. Uh, this is where you're going to want to write down the lighting fixtures that you're seeing. You might now be asking what these area codes have to do with the survey sheet. Well, if we actually go over to our list tab, you'll see that uh, we can predefine our areas and our fixtures. That way, you or whoever is, is doing your audit isn't writing RISS T8, 4 foot, 4 lamp, 32 watts, X number of times. So what we're going to do here is let's just go through an example of, of uh, adding a new fixture. So let's say we want to add an area that's the exterior. So we'll write exterior in area code number 6. So now it's logged to the 6 area code. Then we're going to add, let's say, a metal halide 150 watt wall pack in fixture code number 5. We'll now have a few drop down options, one of which will be metal halide lighting. Great. And the first thing you'll notice is a couple of the columns will start blanking out. We've done this as an automatic feature. If a specific lighting type has the ability to be defined by lamp length or lamp ballast or lamp wattage, those will be accessible, and if it's not, they'll get automatically blacked out. So we'll give a lamp wattage here of, let's, uh, we're doing 150. So we now um, have our fixture watts that is automatically populated as 190. That's sort of what we real, what we've found out is the real-time wattage of the fixture itself. And the reference for the actual fixture wattage is, um, our reference is through the Georgia Power um, handbook, which uh, references, you know, fixture wattages based off of standard electronic ballast. Um, it's also important to note that these drop-down menus are uh, dependent on the previous entry. So let's say there was another light you wanted to put in. It was a T8, two lamp, uh, four foot, 32 watt fixture. So before where we entered in metal halide, there were um, certain future data entries that change. Um, now we're going to enter in a T8. And you can see here that you can enter in a lamp length now. You have the options of two, four, and eight. So we'll do four, uh, electronic ballast, 32 watts, and now we have an option of several types of lamps, and then it will do the fixture wattage based off of um, based off of a George Power spreadsheet. So what, what you can also uh, keep in mind that any columns here that are gray are automatically populated. Any columns that are white are user entry. So if you want to go in and change any of the gray column values. We encourage you to do so. However, keep in mind that they are going to be linked to other areas in the workbook. If you want to know what those areas are, you'll find them right up here. We have our precedent sheets and our dependent sheets all logged out for you. So if you change an item and something seems to not be working down the line, you can at least map it out and fix it accordingly. So let's move now from the list back to the lighting survey and see if we can't enter a few codes. So we'll choose the first meter, the only meter that we have at this building that we've predefined. We'll use code number six for the area. That should be the exterior. And we'll use code number five for that metal halide wall pack that we find. Let's put about 10 of them out there. Um, we have a usage factor. We're going to leave that blank in this instance just to say that we are, it has a 100% usage factor. If we wanted to define anything less than 100%, we could define them as you see 75 and 90 or anything else in between. 
and you would you would use the usage factor, for example, if you walk into a room and half or you know seventy five percent of the light fixtures are on, twenty five percent are burnt out or are never used, so that you can capture this allows you to capture how many fixtures are on the building, but also account for the variances in energy use for light fixtures that are never never used and whatnot. And that will be, more apparent um, in the results tab, which we'll explain in the future, where we're estimating the actual existing energy usage of a building. So now we have our lighting defined. We now need to start thinking about how often it's used and where it is used. So if you scroll over, uh, actually, if we scroll over just a little bit to the right, we'll see that we now want to start defining our location and the associated schedule. So what we'll now do is we'll go We'll say there's an exterior location, and we can go to the schedule tab down here, and we can define an exterior schedule. So we've, what we've done is we've pre-populated some times here, and you can change the times according to your building use, but we're saying from Monday through pretty much the rest of the week, we're operate, these exterior lights are operating from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. without fail. So we automatically calculate the number of annual hours that are being used as well as the number of hours per week. So if we go back to our lighting survey analysis, in this drop down now, we will have seen a newly listed exterior option. And that wouldn't exist until we actually define it in the schedule itself. Great. So now that we've uh, listed that uh, exterior schedule, we can go to the results page, and we'll scroll over to the results. It's the only purple tab on this toolkit. And here we'll actually see that our interior and exterior lights are populated for us. So this toolkit now calculates an estimate of what you would expect to see for your exterior and interior electricity usage. So, you would imagine as we add more lights or take some off or modify them, we will have the ability to change this um, usage to match what our bills actually show. So the, the three that are going to be calculated for you in this toolkit are the interior lighting, the exterior lighting, and the water heating. The other elements that we have here are your heating, cooling, interior equipment, exterior equipment, fans, pumps, refrigeration, um, and plumbing. Uh, all the white, uh, all the white cells are going to be manually input, and all the darker cells are going to be automatically calculated. In fact, actually, one more thing I'd like to add: if we go back to our list, and if we keep scrolling to the right over here, now that we have an existing light, we can actually come up with a proposed new lighting fixture. So what we can do is for the uh, metal halide, let's say we do an LED equivalent metal halide. So it's 150 watts equivalent. Let's say we speak to a contractor and find out that we can get one that operates off of 42 watts with a proposed cost of $350. Now what will happen is if you go to your lighting survey, and we scroll over, we'll actually be able to get an analysis on how much light we would be, how much electricity we'd be using with the new fixture. Uh, and we can also define what kind of controls we're going to have. Let's say we say a photo cell. We'll auto populate some um, numbers here. And we're going to see that there is a 6.2 payback, 6.2 year payback for this particular light if we were to retrofit it. So we're now trying to help you guys figure out how long it will take for you to swap out your old lights and replace them with new lights. We'll do the same thing actually for your plumbing as well. So your plumbing has exactly that same type of layout where we can list a few items. Um, yeah, let's say we wanted to say the bathroom, which is area two. We're going to say we have a toilet that we wanted to list out. Let's say there's five of them. And they flush at three gallons per flush. We're also going to say that it's a manual flush. Um, and that there is a 
flush valve in this instance. The same items are here in terms of auto population. And if we move over to the right, we'll be able to come up with a proposed fixture. So we're going to say it's a toilet. Again, this will be dependent on what you list as your existing fixture. So if you list the sink, a sink retrofit will pop up. If you list the toilet, a toilet retrofit will pop up. We're going to go for 1.28 gallons per flush toilet. And as we scroll over, we'll be able to see a payback. We actually don't have a payback in this instance because we didn't define what the price of our water is um, in the utility section. So we'll go back to the utility section to list that we have two cents per gallon. So now if we go back to our plumbing, we'll see that we've gained uh, a payback of 2.8 years. So not too bad for this existing fixture given the price that we are paying for all of our utilities. And I think uh, let's move on to our equipment. All right, moving on to our last few um, green tabs. Uh, this is the equipment survey. So again, this sheet is printable. And, and so I'll just go to the print screen right here. And you can see that this is what's actually going to be printed when you go to your site. And here I have a couple example entries listed. Again, you can use the area codes or you can write in your area name depending on how you prefer. And then simply here, it's just the equipment name with the quantity. You can assign tags such as refrigerator one, refrigerator two. And the idea here is that you're taking pictures of the model number information of the equipment while you're on site. And then you're entering in that model number information when you get back. Uh, there are a couple of key words entered here at the top for things to look for um, or things that we like to look for with our equipment, including combustion safety, outdoor air, condensate overflow, filters, set points, timers. Um, so you can change that to make it whatever you want to look for in particular at your site. So on these blue headers right here is information you'll actually enter in after you return uh, to your computer and are looking at your pictures of the model numbers. And you can see here there are several inputs, the manufacturer, the model number, the serial number, the manufacturing date, and lastly, the most important, is the equipment category. Again, it's the gray cells that are not for user entry unless specified. Um, these the gray cells have the formulas. The white cells are for user entry. So here we're dividing up um, the different types of equipment that you'll run into. So we have HVAC, office, kitchen, laundry, hot water, or other. And what happens when you select an equipment category is that particular type of equipment will be filtered into a deep, one of the blue details tab. So for example, this equipment category for their refrigerator was kitchen. That's going to go here into the kitchen details tab below. And, but for the HVAC equipment, that um, piece of equipment is going to go into the HVAC details tab. And the reason for that is there's different sort of specs that you want to be reporting for different types of equipment. And so this was the best way that we could disaggregate those types of specifications for each type of equipment. So for example, with the HVAC details, if you go to that tab, you can see that the information and in the equipment survey is auto-populated into the HVAC details tab. As noted by these cells are gray, they have formulas in them, they're pulling information by the equipment survey tab as noted by the precedent sheet equipment survey in cell A1. So moving on into other um, specifications you can enter, uh, there are multiple different um, things that you can enter in for HVAC equipment. The first categories right here, um, noted by existing system, these values are inputs for the HVAC calculator. That calculator is included in the toolkit and is a, a, a relatively simple way of estimating your heating and cooling energy use. So these inputs listed right here are used for that calculator. There are other inputs further on in the workbook which you may want to collect, you may not, just depending on your analysis, um, you can fill it in as needed. The same thing goes for domestic hot water details. 
Um, there are domestic hot water inputs. And then kitchen details and laundry details are a little bit more general in that it's just asking for your existing energy or water use and then your proposed energy and water use. So I know this might be a lot right now, and it's really going to take getting into the Excel workbook and playing around to get a feel for how it all um, connects together and, and where how you'll best be using it. Um, but where everything comes together in the end is the results tab. As Kevin went over, we have end-use graphs right here, which are updated based on um, the entries from the lighting analysis tab and the plumbing tab. Those are the two pre-built-in kind of surveys that we do, um, you'll have to manually enter, excuse me, enter in the um, other end uses uh, listed in white that are not highlighted. And we've included on the side here, and I'll kind of briefly touch on this and recommend you to look um, in on it later, but there's a utility trend calculations for heating and cooling. So you notice in the electricity tab how there was an increase in energy electricity use during the summer due to cooling happening in the building. So what this calculator will do does is that you specify something we're calling a base load, which is basically your, your electricity use during the swing month. And what this is doing is it's looking at um, what you designate as swing months versus what you designate as cooling months and subtracting out the base load from the cooling months to get a general estimate of how much, you know, the order of magnitude of what your cooling energy use is going to be. And so you can use that um, to compare it to the HVAC calculator um, or compare it to other methods. And it's just to make sure that, you know, your, your calculations are matching up with what the actual utility data is showing you that the building's using. So with these inputs, we put in a, you know, base load months happened in April and in November and it estimated a cooling usage of 26,000 kilowatt hours. Um, same thing goes for heating. You estimate you know, the base load during the summer, and it extrapolates out the natural gas used for heating during the winter. And finally, the last thing I'll go over in the results tab is the project summary. And right here, as we said before, we go over the lighting and the plumbing calculators pre-built in. Um, we have our annual cost savings associated with those, and that's just pulling from those tabs um, based on the inputs that were entered, as well as the budgetary costs, payback, and then different energy and water, water savings. And so in this table, you can, you can enter in your own, um, own sort of project here. Um, let's say you wanted to add in roof insulation. And then you would go ahead, and this, this kind of just outlines the format for you of what you need to get. I need to get the cost savings, the budgetary cost, um, and you can add on your own metrics too. All right, and that's, that's an overview of the toolkit. Um, if, uh, if there are any questions, obviously, first please take a look at the instructions that we've provided. Everything that we've shared today is listed pretty explicitly on those instructions.